Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all back uh, on this third and final day of the conference. We again uh, have an exciting program this afternoon. And then tonight, uh, the panels looking back and rounding up, uh, seeing what bridges were built. But uh, first, this afternoon, the afternoon program. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Eibert Tichelaar from the KU Leuven. Uh, Eibert is an international authority in the field of the Dead Sea Scroll Studies, Ancient Judaism. He's editor-in-chief of the Journal of, uh, for the Study of Judaism. And after Florentino, he was leading for many years the IOQS, the International Organization for Quran Studies. Uh, Eibert Tichelaar has a keen eye for details. Uh, fragment reconstruction, careful reading, both paleographically and also literary, but in addition to details, also uh, a broad conceptual thinking and engaging with big ideas in his own field and other fields, an open mind, yet always critical and sharp and very important, creative. We look forward to his presentation, Scribal Culture, Paleography and the Scrolls. Albert, the floor is yours. Um, this presentation is both a short, brief introduction overview of the joint project between uh, the University of Groningen and the KU Leuven, funded by the Dutch and the Flemish uh, research societies. Uh, every year they have a few going to the humanities to joint projects from uh, involving Dutch and Flemish scholars. Uh, the project is Models of Textual Communities and Digital Paleography of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there was a title we made up at the very last, and we would have voiced it slightly differently. And just in advance, virtually all the photographic materials here in this slideshow are from the Leon Levi Dead Sea Scrolls Digital Library from the Israel Antiquities Authority. And only a few days ago, someone said, how is it possible that you could do serious scrolls research without this website? So in any case, uh, for scholars really working with the material, it has been a complete field change and that we have access to all these great photos there. Um, who are in this project from Groningen? It is Mladen and a PhD student who will present in a moment. Ihan Aksu, he's working specifically on epistographs, and Nikkeu Leuven, it is me and Hanneke van der Schoor, also a PhD student and uh, working mainly on the Testament of Kahat and more broadly on some of the Aramaic testamentary literature. And on the right, you see uh, just sample. Uh, work that is somehow related to uh, this project by the four of us. Um, so what do we do? What are the focuses in our project? And I'm, I'm not even sure whether we first them, but the way I see it here is on the one hand, we ask questions. How do our models, scholarly models of textual communities or the textual community of Qumran influence our interpretation of the texts as a whole or of specific texts? And on the other hand, how does the textual study of one of more of those texts, for example, the Testament for Kahat, but we could take many other examples, enable a reassessment of scholarly models. And specifically for the Groningen and Leuven collaboration, uh, specific angles. On the one hand, we are all uh, very much interested in material and paleographical approaches. Uh, on the other hand, we want to read the scrolls and look at everything that has to do with uh, Qumran in a broader context, it's both a broader Jewish context and a broader Mediterranean context. So that is very roughly the uh, project. Um, the original title which Mladen announced was actually a title placeholder or a placeholder title. Mladen said, well, we'll just write that and you can do whatever you want. And I decided only on Sunday or Saturday, I forgot that I would focus specifically on elementary and unskilled hands in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there's a lot of loose ends and there are certainly a few in the audience who probably have a lot to say and I would really welcome any feedback or pushback or whatever on what I'm going to discuss with you. 
So why would one be interested in elementary and unskilled hands in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, on the one hand, there's a paleographical interest. Uh, the question is, for example, how to actually recognize and how to describe the differences, let's call it, of skill amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls scribes. We all have more or less the feeling we look at some scrolls, we think that is really beautiful, well written, and other one we think it's a mess, but many of those are in between. So how do we uh, discern that? How do we interpret that? And how do we describe it? What kind of labels are we giving? Uh, there's also, for me, uh, it, it specifically has to do with this spectrum ranging from, on the one hand, elementary, and perhaps one should add also unskilled to calligraphic and very skilled, which are our labels largely. Of course, calligraphy was perhaps also already an ancient label. But there's also a scribal cultural interest, and that has everything to do with this project. So uh, on the one hand, if we're looking at elementary script, then we might think what were people trained to write. So what kind of evidence of training should we be looking for? Or could we be looking for in the scrolls or larger at the site of Qumran? And on another, another aspect is, can we draw any correlations between types of hands, and I mean elementary or calligraphic and other aspects of manuscripts that we are, for example, uh, are the connections with other scribal features. People have, of course, noted that those with a really bad hand often also are not really good in spelling, but there's much more to be said about that. Or is there also a correlation with content? For example, it has been commented upon uh, really implicitly by Cross, but also explicitly that many of our most beautiful hands are those used in biblical scrolls. But how do we explain that? Or do we only imagine that that is the case? So uh, all these kinds of questions uh, go beyond the paleographic and uh, relate to uh, scribal culture interest. All the photos that I was shown, I won't comment on all of them, are related to what I'm telling. What you see here is one of the hands which I would call one of the most elementary and perhaps also unskilled. It's from the two fragments which were first copied, first published as part of MMT, but then taken apart and seen as a separate uh, document for Q, calendrical document. And just let's go with the cursor over it. One of the things that you see here, and you'll see it later also, is this Aleph, which of course is not exactly the same as that one, but this is a very elementary one. Basically, virtually all the letters that you see here are elementary. I cannot discuss all the pictures that I will show, but once in a while I will just comment on a few of them. Uh, what, we, what I want to refer now, but perhaps Judith may convince me that I should really use other terms, but what I want to refer to with elementary and unskilled or skilled is to some extent related to what in the past, and I'm talking about Cross and about Joseph Maffe, what they refer to as vulgar. And I'll give you two quotes. Cross, uh, distinguished one of the many so-called semi-formal Herodian scripts. And he said, one of those is a vulgar one. And he uses the word quite a lot, which he described uh, as, and this is just an abbreviation of his description as a crude, simplified form of the Herodian formal script. And if you would look at present day terminology, you would say that actually he's trying to describe an elementary script. Uh, Nafe gives all credit to Cross and refers to him, but actually describes Vogel in a different way, namely as the handwriting of a person who has learned the, learned the formal script, like the educated person, but who is not skilled enough for independent development. Not quite sure what he means by independent development, but it's clear he doesn't refer to a script, but he refers to a hand. But in the case of Nafe, it's not quite clear whether he refers to an elementary hand or to an unskilled hand. But that is already setting the stage for the discussion that we will go and have. So the picture that you see here is one of Cross's examples of a uh, what he calls a vulgar semi-formal script. He calls it crude and simplified. Well, the simplified is clear. It's not quite sure how we should uh, use the word crude. I'm not sure whether I would want to call this crude, but certainly it is elementary and simplified, though it doesn't look too bad. And uh, not really unskilled. So what is the terminology we're using? Um, and again, 
someone may convince me that something is really wrong with this terminology, but then you can tell me afterwards. Uh, as an elementary script, uh, and I'm using ter terms by phrases by Mark Smith and Armando Petrucci, and uh, one could see with Petrucci who wrote, was perhaps the first one to, to single out these scripts in medieval text as a model or basic script taught at school at the very first stage of education, hence elementary, elementary education. And uh, for example, one would have very basic strokes of the letters, simplified structure of the letters and decorations would sometimes be stripped off. And you can see in what cross calls the Thoga, some of the decorations are stripped off, but not all of them. Elementary hands, on the other hand, is what is actually written down. Someone who takes the elementary script as a model, uh, rightly or wrongly so. Uh, unskilled writers, uh, and there's a difference between elementary and, and, and lack of skill. Unskilled writers actually lack the competence to, this is my definition, but I think it should be okay, lack the competence to meet the required norms of their models. And Mark Smith, uh, paleographer, uh, medieval Latin script, uh, states explicitly and emphasizes that skill is a relative notion. That means, uh, for example, one could have a, a writer who is quite skilled in using an elementary script as a model, but as soon as this scribe wants to write more calligraphic, it's clear that he is not able to, uh, he doesn't have the competence to do that. And there are other examples, especially in medieval times, that there are many types of scripts and one could be very competent in one uh, type, but not at all or less in the other one. One should, and this is really difficult for me, but also uh, in how we describe, we should make basically a difference between an unskilled writer who does not have the competence to uh, meet the required norms of the model and one who writes carelessly, who potentially can meet uh, these norms, but does not do it all the time. Uh, and it's interesting that we have a few scrolls that actually show that one writer at some point really uh, is writing much more carefully, meeting uh, norms of the model and then lapses back because of haste or because of lack of interest into a more sloppy, careless, whatever term one wants to use, writing. These are all really problematic terms if one uses sloppy or careless or whatever. Two examples, uh, one is 4Q550 which starts off quite nicely and gradually is, becomes more careless, even to the extent that previous scholars just split the text into different parts, uh, arguing these, these hands are different, so they must be different works. And perhaps even, but this goes back to Judith, and she may quite be right, is that there's, even though we distinguish two hands in one Q, have a pair then it may be just one writer. Um, learning the elementary script. Well, actually, we don't have um, scrolls or uh, which have that, but we have this nice Ostracon, which was uh, actually first published by Cross in the 50s and then by, I think, by Esti um, in the 90s. Uh, what Cross was most interested in was just the dating of the script. We just look at it and uh, you can see that this is a, a, a scribe who really still has to learn uh, in many respects. It's interesting that, for example, all um, everyone would transliterate this text, just read, see the Lamet name Noon, but of course this is not what we expect from a Noon. It looks much more like a final cuff, or it even looks a lot like the dialect. And we can make a lot of comments about this. And actually, there's virtually no one has, has written about this very interesting Ostracon, but we can't go into it later. But let's assume that this is just a first century common era uh, ele elementary script, which this scribe tries to emulate with mixed success, let's put it like that. So how do we recognize unskilled hands? And of course, I already said skill is, is a fluid notion. Um, 
first of all, one could find letter forms that, according to us at least, and we have a lot of material, uh, do not really correspond to the model elementary script. Um, um, sometimes this is clear through by a large variance in the letter forms, often in those scripts by a mingling of cursive and formal forms. Sometimes some letters, especially the tough, but sometimes also other ones are written in with the looped cursive forms and other letters are not, but sometimes they even use both the cursive and the formal forms for one and the same letter. Uh, the real giveaway, which you don't see in charts, and uh, Michael Langlois already commented on the charts and the figures, but if you just put the letters one side, one along, well, along one another, one doesn't see it, but if you see them in context, you can see that some of those scribes have a really irregular size of the letters, they, uh, they dance up and down, they don't uh, pay attention to uh, the lines, there's a well, I put it here, irregular horizontal placement. Sometimes also, which you also can't see, is the um, how they are juxtaposed to one another, lack of spacing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Something which is really remarkable, and I'm not an expert on that, but probably a lot of you here could comment on that, how it comes that in many of those scripts, one sees even on the photographs, a really strong different, one can see where they started inking again and again and again. And I'm not sure how it comes that in the more calligraphic scripts, one has a real problem seeing that. But in this case, is, uh, it, this is an example that you really see clearly uh, every time the, the scribe started inking again. Uh, something that doesn't have to do with uh, calligraphic, sorry, with paleographic competence, but with orthographic competence, but you see a lot of those that have uh, differences. Uh, that correspond. Drew, you are waving all the time and you are, uh, it, it distracts me. Um, um, so how to gather those unskilled and elementary hands? Uh, first of all, uh, if you just go through all the DSD volumes, you will see that the editors very rarely identify uh, hands as either elementary or unskilled. And it is interesting for the experts uh, who are here that uh, Cross's 1961 volume, which has been seen as where we all go back to, he gives no charts of the Vulgar semi-formal, even though he describes it. And I think that that may be the reason that uh, subsequent editors who referred, who were told to look at Cross uh, rarely or actually never in DGD identify any hand to describe it as this vulgar semi-formal Herodian. Uh, Cross gave no examples in this article and hence we don't know uh, how it should look like. However, if you go to DGD3, he gives an, a series of examples. And actually, uh, John Stripnell is the only one who really adopts Cross's vulgar semi-formal Herodian. So we have this label going back to the 60s and perpetuated by Struknell in the 70s, and then it just dies away. Um, so both Cross and Struknell gave a list of those, uh, gave a list of some of the manuscripts which uh, they would call Felger, but actually Cross said there are numerous manuscripts in K4 that are like that, but apparently we didn't take it. So what, was, what does one have to do? One simply has to go through all the images of the manuscripts that uh, that are there and just try to make one give, come up with one's own assessment. There are of course problems. Uh, many fragments are so broken or so badly preserved that they give the, sometimes the impression of being unskilled, but it is it could have all kinds of other reasons. And also I must say there's two things I didn't pay much attention to because it really is problematic. Uh, Many of the Hasmonean texts are written in what scholars have called semi-formal or semi-cursive problematic terms, but it's really difficult to see uh, to what extent uh, which kind of elementary script was at the basis of what they were doing and whether they do doing it well or wrong. And I've also omitted mainly the uh, papyrus things for other reasons. So I've been looking largely at not exclusively at more Herodian type things on parchment. Uh, 
I want to start with some samples, and some of those have been mentioned by Cross or Strugnell, and some have not. Uh, this one has been discussed by Strugnell, but he never called it Fogger, but I would, I would want to call it a kind of elementary script, Fogge 176. This is the first column that is preserved for Katangemim, and just look at it. It, it is quite basic, typical also for a lot of those scripts, what is happening here, that shouldn't happen. Um, it's a very uh, angular and unadorned uh, sense. In this case, there are some of mistakes that are made, but a bit more or less described still adheres to spacing and more or less to fine ruling and not the ruling, but more or less to straight lines of course, this is really broken, etc. But this is one, and we could look at it later, but probably there will be no time. Um, another case mentioned by Cross as a filter hand. So this is a slightly, this is also basically an elementary hand, but you see it's it's more uh, already developed into uh, it, it, it has some curves, it has some adornments, but basically this is what Cross we actually referred to when he was talking about filter semi-formal hands. I don't like the term Vogue at all because it has all these associations which we should uh, get rid of, but okay, this is uh, a nice hand. Uh, and if we talk about, and this is a real great example, and it's not clear, quite clear what we should do here. This is also not Herodian, I think, but we don't actually know at all what it is. Um, if we would have something like an elementary or unskilled hand, we should have, we should need to look at this hand. For Q79, it has only a part of the first chapter of Hosea. And uh, um, we could call it elementary or we could call it unskilled. Uh, the editor who published it did have no clue what it was. He calls it idiosyncratic, he calls it archaic, etc. It clearly isn't really irregular writing with multiple forms of the letters, uh, medial forms used in at the end and final forms at the beginning, and it has a really uncommon orthography. And actually, if you're just used to uh, looking at normal scrolls, this is really difficult to read. Let me just give you one example. Uh, hey, which is clear. This could be a resh, which is not that strange. And this would be a sade, whatever that is. And in total, we also have the orthographic thing. So this would be ha'ares and this would be min. So this is not so easy to read for uh, compared to many of the other scrolls. And this is, but why this is the case, we, of course, we see irregular lining here, and uh, I am not entirely sure whether this is just a matter of lack of skill, but perhaps this was a scribe that was trained in a different way. That makes it really difficult. Uh, blessed are those who work with manuscripts from the medieval times, since they have so much material with which they can compare, but we have this really heterogeneous paleographic uh, Palais of texts, and we have no clue where they come from. Sometimes this editor says, well, look, at some of the letters, they look a little bit like the Nabataean ones, but okay, so where do we stand? Uh, this is perhaps a good example of an elementary and to a large extent also an unskilled hand. The forms are elementary, though they are, they are slightly nicer than the ones we saw before in 4Q111 and 107. There are a lot of errors in this text and that makes it interesting. Why are scholars not interested in the errors that are made? And um, it, the lining is irregular and one just wonders what kind of a scribe is this? Uh, there is a kind of flair in the execution of some of the letters, so this scribe is not entirely uh, unskilled, but um, certainly this is not a skilled scribe. So this is already, I'm looking for the terms, I'm looking for um, how to describe them. Um, Cross at some point uh, in his very brief descriptions of all the 4Q uh, Serif manuscripts called 4QSH, 4Q262, he called it, called it one of those vulgar ones. Well, yes, clearly it has the same kind of elementary forms. And if you would put them next to the other ones that we saw earlier, they would be more or less the same. We also see that there are um, 
quite a lot of variations. This is a nice case with the Bayamim and with the different jots and with the rounded ones, which one also only sees at this, we see the same in the pay, of course, only at a later stage. We have a clear uneven inking, which one sees often in these hands and there is the overwriting, etc. This is basically only two small fragments. I think that one might just as well, be, even though it looks quite different, add 4Q263 to uh, the category of elementary and, uh, well, to some extent unskilled. What one sees is, a, again, a large variation of the letters. You see a, a small chart uh, at the bottom. Uh, these are actually the only two fragments that we have. We see uh, orthographic uh, error and we see uh, quite unequal inking. And one also sees that depending on the ink, and it also has to do with the pen that the shapes of the letters also become differently. At least, at least one can say that there's no real effort in uh, a large degree of consistency. Um, Another example, and some of you will see that I've taken some of those I've been working on in the last years is 6Q15, uh, which does not really look nice. And if one takes the other fragments together with it, one sees that it is it's quite irregular in its writing. I Actually, I, I tend to, to make these judgments on letters. I'm not sure whether one is allowed to do that, but I really don't like Shins like that. And I think that his, uh, he, he didn't really uh, know what, uh, didn't anticipate the kind of space that he would need for the pen, etc. We also see again, and we see it also in the other fragments that uh, Alephs were omitted, etc., etc. Um, I'm running through this because my, in ex my experience is that I always spend too much time and this will, happens the same again here. Uh, I will skip this one. I just saw this today. This is interesting that Milik, or it wasn't Milik, but that this was added that all the fragments here are dubious and the dubious is probably not about what they were, accounts of Lisp, but perhaps a statement by Milik that he wasn't certain where they actually came from. That is just on an aside. Uh, the calendrical document that we had here uh, that I mentioned earlier here, we have some, you can I blow it up and you can really see that this is, uh, even if you start reading it, you see that uh, if there are spaces, they are sometimes at the wrong place. Um, this is a nice example. What is this? I mean, you would always be tempted to hear to read this together and this, we can't read it, but actually it should be Bo, Mo, H, or whatever. So, and this is typical of this uh, scribe. Um, these were put together by Kim Ron, but clearly, if you compare it, you will see that uh, this script, even though it has the same type of letters, is much less elementary and the spacing is more regular. Uh, I'm going through it, I'm going to skip that one. Uh, I'm going to, these are three that Milik put together and discussed together as having correspondences, and now we come to the end. Um, I said we're not only interested in paleography, but also in scribal cultural questions. So what kind of evidence do we have of training? On the one hand, we have this alphabetic Ostracon, which shows at the very least that at the site of Qumran, there was someone who was learning to form the letters and still had a lot of problems with them. That is probably the most we can say. Um, we don't know who it was, whether that was a covenanter or just someone else. We don't know, but someone was trying to learn to write, to do some basic writing. We see that in some texts we have elementary writing and sometimes and often also unskilled writing. And some of those texts are what I call lists like collections, whether it's calendrical or the Newtonian one, which I skipped over in a few moments ago. Um, another possible evidence of training could be now, when one has multiple hands of different quality or skills in one manuscript, and we'll see it later, 4Q176 is a great one where you, one could almost imagine that someone who's still learning to write and is 
just giving a list of quotations from Isaiah, and then it is taken over by someone who really has a skilled hand. Uh, perhaps another evidence is the multiple corrections of mistakes when combined when, with this elementary hand. One could almost imagine a teacher just correcting it. It is not someone who's changing this small mistake in a great copy of a biblical book, but it's just, this is wrong, this is wrong, etc. cetera. I will really try to hurry up. Um, other material correlations could be, and if one looks at those, that many of those are small scrolls with uh, virtually no margins, and sometimes they are just one sheets, and perhaps these are even practice sheets. What well, two examples, and I, I think not everyone will agree with me. The one for Q6 is probably, uh, one would not disagree, even though it's, it's not an unskilled hand at all, but it's clearly a one sheet uh, practice. Emmanuel calls it a writing exercise, but this is someone who already knows to write, but still is trying to write better perhaps. And perhaps 4Q175 should also fall in this category. Uh, we won't go into details here. So if we look at correlations of content on the one hand, and I just made this up while I was going with it, I think, what, wait a moment, here we have a series of lists of different kinds and the calendrical list or the tongue of the quotations list and perhaps etc. cetera, the Nutimim list, and we could go further. Uh, would list not be uh, a really apt choice for uh, if one is doing uh, learning writing? On the other hand, and this is also a suggestion that I just give, is it coincidence that we have so many of these rule of the community manuscripts that are written in elementary and sometimes unskilled hands? Was perhaps or were perhaps parts of the rule of the community part of the curriculum for learning to write? This is a question I can only pose. I can't, cannot answer it, of course. Uh, so this brings us to the more general question. What is the function of writing manuscripts when we see elementary or unskilled hands? We all know, of course, one can write beautiful manuscripts for use in synagogues or whatever, but why would one write all these in other hands? Well, generally one just sim said simply, and this is what Judith also commented on two days ago, oh yes, they are personal copies. Now, what, is, what do we mean by the personal copies? Often this is stated about the cave six material. These are personal copies, but they have share so many things with the cave four materials that it doesn't really make sense to differentiate. Here we have one nice example from cave six, which for all kinds of reasons, one would say this is a personal copy of Daniel. Another point given by Mladen is, wait a moment, perhaps one did not always, uh, you all know, as most of you know, this article, but basically, writing could also have a function as a help or alongside memorization of text. So not necessarily that one writes it for other people to read. Uh, I would add to these here a hypothesis that some manuscripts that we have along the scrolls have been produced as part of the training of the script and subsequently also of practicing with basic text. So one in the curriculum, just as the first part of um, Homer was used specifically at school, so perhaps part of the rule of the community was used. Okay, bringing last slide, slide coming back to if we talk about models of textual communities, what is it or what does this help us? Or what does it tell us? First of all, um, um, we have to think of a or multiple communities which were not only elite scholars dealing with scholarly texts, etc., but they were also communities that taught different levels of scribal education where people were trained to write. And second, and this is a more general comment, is that any interpretation of the collection of Qumran needs to take much more account than has been done of the large scribal and paleographic heterogeneity that we find among the scrolls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert.
Uh, you went over your time, but it was worth it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, I am looking at the time. I would suggest that we leave the Q&A to the general discussion after Hanukkah's paper. Uh, I know I've noted uh, Drew and Sydney, uh, and maybe other questions uh, will come up. But thank you very, very much. It's a fascinating material, and I think also great hypotheses put forward. Thank you.